Hello, and welcome back to my channel. Today for my Spooktober look, I'm wearing my favorite purple lipstick from NYX, as well as a brand new um, dark blue um, glittery eyeshadow I just got, and a little bit of mascara. I know it looks really thick, but I unfortunately don't have any makeup brushes at the moment, because, you know, tomboyish women don't generally wear makeup, so it does look a little, like, thick and vampirish, but that's a good look for Spooktober anyway, so... Today I'm going to be um, reviewing this book, which I mentioned previously, Carney's House Party by Maud Hart Lovelace. It's one of the um, three books in her Deep Valley um, spin-off of sorts series from the um, Betsy Tacey series. They're set in the um, same fictitious town in Minnesota, which is very strongly based on her own hometown, and the um, characters in the main series also appear throughout the spin-off book. So this is um, based on a blog post, which I wrote at the beginning of August. I really, really enjoyed this book. I mean, I wasn't expecting to love it nearly as much as I did. Uh, of the 11 Maud Hart Lovelace books, well, actually, now I've read um, 12 of them to date, but this was my absolute favorite still, even after reading um, Emily of Deep Valley, which I also recently reviewed. I only have one more of her books to um, read and review in the main series, and then like I'll basically be done with her um, major works. I read um, Carney's House Party in one day and was left wishing for more books about Carney. And frankly, I like her more than um, Betsy after reading this. Betsy is uh, t one of the two title characters and the um, main character of the main um, Betsy Tacey series, and she's a doppelganger of um, the author as well. This book um, fills in a lot of well, some of the gaps between um, Betsy and Joe and Betsy and the Great World, which are the um, I think the ninth and the tenth, if I'm not mistaken, um, books in the um, Betsy Tacey series, and it fills in the background a lot better than the info dumpy backstory in Chapter Two of um, Betsy and the Great World. But that's another topic when I um, review the main series in those particular books. Well, I think I suppose I love this book so much because the characters are now 19 and 20 years old at university, stepping into a more mature stage of life. While there are still plenty of picnics, dances, day trips, and such with the crowd, as they call their group of friends in this book, they don't feel as shallow as they did in the high school book, since that's not all they do anymore. And I, this isn't like a problem I have with the books themselves or the characters or um, the writing. It's just I personally, uh, as someone who is very introverted and like deliberately avoided the cliche, you know, high school teenager scene and events like, you know, sports and social life and dating and parties and things like that, and like disobeying my parents and sneaking out of the house. I just didn't do that at all. It had absolutely no interest to me. And the characters, most of them in the Betsy Tacey series, they do generally have that kind of, you know, cliche, stereotypical, like, teen and high school experience, like being, you know, popular boys really like the girls and they love dating and they can't wait to go to dances and do all this stuff. And they don't really care too much about, you know, studying in school. It's all about mostly their, um, social life throughout the book so that's just personally isn't something I can relate to doesn't mean the characters are bad or the writing sucks it's just like a me thing it's just kind of outside of my wheelhouse so I relate better to characters who aren't like that or who at least don't do that to the like near exclusion of other things I'm more interested in and Carney's relationships or romantic relationships with them Larry and Sam also fear, feel a lot more realistic and mature than Betsy's relationship with Joe there's just more depth and emotional development, although, again, this isn't really a problem necessarily with the characters or writing in the main series. It's just that because Joe's main focuses are uh, working, going to school, and, and studying instead of, you know, social life and partying like Betsy and her friends, we just generally don't get to see all that much of him until she, he, she um, Betsy starts um, going out with Joe and um, Betsy and Joe. So, again, that's, you know, not like a fault of the books. It's just, you know, something... I notice about the books that, you know, might be particular to me and maybe a few other people. And again, I didn't grow up with these books. I came to them as an adult, so therefore my perspective might be much different than someone who's coming to them with a lot of, you know, romanticized nostalgia because they've been, like, reading and loving these books since they were, you know, a child or a preteen or a teen. So anyway, in Carney's House Party, it's June 1911, and Caroline Sibley, who nickname is Carney, is concluding her sophomore year at Vassar, back when it was still um, only a girls' college. It's really unfortunate. A lot of these single-sex schools have basically all gone co-ed. You just, like, single-sex education is, like, really a beautiful and special thing, and I wish I had gone to an all-female um, college in hindsight. Though there are a lot of strict controls on the students to keep their minds on academia and prevent too much contact with men, Carney and her friends still manage to have a whole lot of fun. Unlike Betsy, Carney also really likes college. But there is one dilemma weighing upon Carney's mind as the spring semester draws to a close. 
whether or not to invite her roommate Isabel Porteous to visit her house back in Deep Valley, Minnesota. As much as she genuinely likes Isabel, Carney fear fears her small Midwestern town won't make a great impression upon a sophisticated Long Islander steeped in Eastern culture, customs, and refinement. How could Deep Valley ever possibly hope to compare to New York City and the Hamptons? And, you know, back in these days, um, there was a lot more, you know, pronounced class distinctions and class consciousness. Even people who were, you know, upper middle class were distinct from, like, you know, regular bourgeoisie people and, like, rich people. And the, even the rich were divided between, you know, new and old money. So that was, like, a huge distinction in those days, which many people just aren't genuinely aware of these days. They basically under, operate in the assumption, oh, everyone is middle class. And if you're not, you don't really exist or we should just write you off as a dinosaur or a fossil. So... Carney hopes to throw a house party over summer vacation since her old friend Bonnie is back from Paris. And Bonnie appeared um, in um, Heaven to Betsy, the first of the high school books in the main series. And her father is a, a, a Protestant um, pastor and was um, called back um, to Paris where they had been. And everyone was really upset to see her go. But the real girl whom Bonnie was based upon, her family just moved to St. Paul. They didn't have a glamorous location like Paris waiting for them. In a letter, Mrs. Sibley cheerfully suggests Isabel can stay there too. But while the Sibleys clearly seem to be upper middle class, as evidenced by, you know, their large house and all the sorts of luxuries and other things they, you know, have and enjoy and take for granted, they still don't have oodles of servants, a pool, a tennis court, a mansion, nothing Isabel is used to. A big brouhaha erupts when Isabel has a male visitor. Not only does she entertain him in a parlor in the dorm, she also brings him to dinner in the mandatory daily chapel service in those days quite, um, a lot of schools, you they made students attend church or chapel every day or like even maybe every week. Thankfully, that has um, changed now with them. Um, people take the Establishment Clause a lot more seriously, and they don't force students, regardless of religion or whatever they believe, to attend a certain church or any church or chapel once a week. They just, you know, believe what you believe, do your religion on your own time. The school has no business, you know, enforcing like religious beliefs on you. And all um, Isabel's friends are mad with curiosity to know just who he is and how serious they are. The storyline is handled very well throughout the book, keeping the reader wondering until near the very end, till just what the truth between Isabel and Howard really is. This was uh, one of my favorite aspects of the book. It is more of a subplot than the main plot, but I really enjoyed how we watched it unfold because it wasn't like something you could guess within uh, like, you know, 15 minutes what, you know, who Howard really is and what their relationship it is and what the outcome between them is going to be. And there's lots of some little twists and turns along the way in their relationship too. Carney is very glad to be home with her parents and three little, bro little brothers, Hunter, Jerry, and Bobby. Bobby is the youngest. He's, I think, about nine or ten years old, and Bobby was really um, cute and fun to read. I love the depictions of their warm family life and the character development of each Sibley. One of the things I've struggled with in the Betsy Tacey series is lack of deep character development, or at least among the um, many, many secondary characters. Some of the secondary characters do emerge as more than just names on a page, but because of the cast bloat and because of, you know, how thick and fast a lot of these characters are thrown at us instead of being, you know, gradually developed one by one or in like a small pair or trio over time, they're just, you know, bang, 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 here are all these brand new friends Betsy has and we have to remember them and know what makes them distinct from one another. And, you know, it can be hard to discern any real difference between, for example, Cab and Denny or Alice and Irma. It's like I forget who some of these characters even are or what they're supposed to be like because they're just names on a page. They're not really emerging as strong secondary characters or taking a lot up a lot of pages. But, you know, anyway, ensemble cast can work, but you just have to, you know, develop them properly instead of just throwing them all at us at, at once and expecting us to keep track instantly and magically. And no wonder Mrs. Lovelace's editors advised her to make Winona a composite character instead of adding yet another new person. The Winona is one of the more um, prominent secondary characters. She's based on two different girls. The child Winona is based on one girl, and the high school, like in young adult Winona, is based on a different girl. And her characters were worried because they already had um, so many characters in the books, and they just felt like, you know, even one more might be just a little bit too much for the readers to keep track of. So Winona became composite. So anyway, Isabel arrives after July 4th, and she and Carney take a day trip to Murmuring Lake. While there, they meet Sam Harris, whose rich family just moved to the area. Carney isn't impressed with his extra pounds, unkempt hair, 
unshaved face and horrible habit of charging everything. But Isabel seems quite taken and Carney nicknames him, you know, somewhat, you know, tongue in cheek, baby hippo, because he does look a little bit like a hippo to her because he's not, not like obese or anything, but he's like, you know, a little bit pudgy, or at least he appears so before he, you know, starts dressing a little bit differently. And it's just something fun about the book and their the beginning of their relationship. And this development makes Carney very happy, um, Isabel's interest in Sam, since if the two of them become an item, it'll assure Isabel's visit is a smashing success, and she'll have good things to say about Deep Valley when she goes back to her home in New York and talks to the other girls at Vassar and her family. Presently, there's a masquerade party, and who should arrive but Betsy, whom everyone assumed was still in California with her grandma. Betsy had a bout of appendicitis early in her freshwoman year at the University of Minnesota, and she was um, sent out west to recover, and she stayed there even after she got um, significantly better, and she focused on her writing and just taking a wonderful gap year off from school, and she also started building a relationship with her uncle whom she had never um, met before or he didn't she didn't meet him before in the end of the fourth book but he didn't like and never um, appears again at least in the books I've read so far in this series and again that's something I really and many other fans wish um, Mrs. Lovelace had written about this year Betsy spends in California instead of just you know telling us about it after the fact in other books so I really wish you know we had a whole book to you know follow her throughout college in that gap year. Betsy becomes the fourth girl on the sleeping porch during Carney's long house party. With another guest added, there's even more fun to be had. And then another guest announces his impending arrival. Carney's long-distance beau, Larry Humphreys, moved to California after their sophomore year of high school. They've written weekly letters ever since and assumed they'd eventually reunite and live happily ever after. But though Carney still has great affection for Larry, that old romantic spark just doesn't seem to be there anymore, and she's not making any effort to go off with him alone. He seems more like a buddy than a boyfriend. In comparison, Carney loves spending time with Sam, and talking with him comes so naturally, even about personal feelings. And Sam also has a wonderful relationship with her family, and particularly her little brother Bobby, her baby brother Bobby, and like they have, you know, wonderful things together. And there's an important um, subplot where, you know, Sam comes to the rescue when Bobby goes missing. He took something he was reading a little bit too seriously and tried to act it out. And he's like running away during this like intense rain and thunder and lightning storm. And like Sam basically comes to the rescue to find Bobby. And it's just so many wonderful like little like subplots and events throughout this book. I just can't recommend it highly enough. So, will Carney choose the old love with her high school sweetheart or the new love with a man who seems perfectly matched in so many ways? Just what is going on with Isabel's love life? And if you have read the Betsy Tacey series first, you will know in Carney's husband choice is like mentioned early on and on Betsy in the Great World, she's saying, oh, Carney is now Mrs. Husband's full name. So you basically know that anyway, but just, you know, seeing it on unfold if you already know and like learning why she made that particular decision and you know why the man she didn't choose like that was the right decision also it's like just wonderful to watch unfolding so thank you very much for watching I would um, very highly recommend this book and the um all the other books by Maud Hart Lovelace although they are you know a little bit of their time with the more slightly old-fashioned writing style and as I have mentioned it's a little bit somewhat harder for me to relate to the characters because they have a much different you know like class background and like social life personalities interests than I had at that age but they are very um, wonderful books like snapshots into a, a bygone era the late Victorian and the Edwardian era and a little bit like the World War One era as well so um tune in next time I think I'll be shooting another vlog right after this one of my um, Dante and Post two for the price of one because I didn't expect to be I'm um, able to film today and I was so please consider subscribing I'll be doing a lot more um book reviews in future and a little bit of author tube as well and maybe some booktube tags as well so thank you very much for tuning in thank you bye